shoot, come on, that's good, right? Um, that's some great truth. She's good. We went and saw her this week. She's uh, every time she. That was, that was, that was man, she yeah. loved that one, dude. You know I mean? we had yeah. The we did that, and she said, she's the one that said, first. you know there's two more versions. <laughs> <laughs> so we added one more, and she came up after that, she said, you know there's still one more person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's doing well. She's oh, ready to come back. She they, she loves you guys. She just, you know, just having to heal everything up, you know, so... But, uh, man, we had a great evening with her and her uh, daughter and son-in-law, Rusty, and so it was a, it was a good night. So she's doing well. Uh, all right. Hey, let's uh, let's jump into some truth today. So let's do this. Let's just uh, ask God to speak to us right where he is. You know the drill. We do this every time. So you quietly pray that. I'm going to do it, and then we're going to jump some truth. Oh, they're grateful for the opportunity just to sing praise to you, to chat among each other, and to encourage each other with what you put in our own spirit as it relates to the worship that we sing to you, and the encouragement that we get in the truths that we sing to you. But Father, make no mistake, we're singing to you, your praise, because you alone are worthy of that. And God, you're marvelous, marvelous. Those of us, Father, who realize the depth of our sin find great appreciation in your mercy and your grace. For what we did deserve, you chose not to give to us. And so, we're forever changed because of that. So today, Father, if we open up your word, would you uh, have your way in it? In our life, would you let the word be powerful? Would you let it uh, be transformative? And today, Father, uh, would you allow the blessed Holy Spirit to have his way in our life? To do a work in the middle of a message in the areas of our heart that just need to be tweaked. And so we ask that you'd accomplish that by your grace. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We are uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit. And um, where we've, we've seen, we looked at old school or what we call immerse, right? How we came to Christ uh, and what that looks like and how do we get to where he wants us. And we ended with Ephesians 2.10. Remember that? We, we, it really has been a theme that we've talked about for quite a while now. But Ephesians 2.10. See, the whole point is you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy, made you alive. Not by works, but by grace. Right? Faith in Him. Um, and in and, and that same... So we looked at that. What does it look like to, 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 uh, to confess our sins, to repent and to believe? What happens to us when we invite Christ into our life? He begins the process of transforming us through His Word. And so there's a change that takes place. And we fast-track that change as we put off ourself. The faster we can die to self, the faster we can get where we want to go with Him. And so, so we put off the old man on a daily, minute-by-minute minute basis. We put off that old man, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Because the old man wants to chase stupid stuff. I don't know about you, but my man, whoo, I can chase some stupid stuff, right? I mean, I can do that in a hurry. But I have to be made new in the attitude of my mind. If I'm not constantly feeding on the Word of God and hearing it, reminding it, and working it, not so it's just in my, in my head, but it's in my heart, it's in the wheelhouse, as that begins to happen and you realize that that old man really can't give you anything at all, though he lies to you daily and says he can, you put off that old man. Made new in the attitude of your mind. You put on the new self, which is created to look like God, true righteousness and true holiness. What does that look like? And then Paul gave us a great understanding of what that looked like. And so we saw those things. I'm not going to belabor that. But he tells us there are certain things you should put off and certain things you should put on. One is, is quit speaking lies. Speak truth. One is quit being selfish with your money. But when you work, save, put some aside. You can help those who, who haven't been blessed financially like you have. These are all the things through the Scriptures. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. Speak only words that are good for others. You, we don't have time to waste trashing everybody else in the presence of somebody else. We... Uh, are going to be those who think about what we say that comes out of our mouth, that it would be wholesome and edifying and building others up. These, This is all woven that we've looked at in this series. We looked at the at the, at the book of uh, 1 John, and we saw where there, 
There are marks. These aren't the things that we do to be saved, but they're the things that saved people do. We have a desire to do the Word of God. We love our brother. There's a series of those things. And when you see that, you know that you know. And when you know that you're a child of God, and you can't lose that because you didn't do anything to earn it, it's a game changer. There's no doubt ever in your mind, again, shouldn't be about who God is and what He's done for us and who we are in Christ. And so we should walk the rest of our days knowing that He is who He says He is. That I am who He says I am. And I can do what He says I can do. And He can do what He says He can do. And so there's a trust in Him in that process. And so we looked at all of that. We talked about the spiritual gifts that God has placed within each and every one of us. That to each one of us, a manifestation of the grace of God has been given. So within this room, by myself, I can only bring one facet as I'm filled with the Spirit, the grace of God. But together in this room, we've got a, a, a multitude of the facets of God that's here. And so as we, as we speak to each other and as we move among each other, God is made visible among us. We house the fullness of the living God. This is the body of Christ. We've looked at all of these things, so I'm not telling you anything that we don't know. Then we moved into understanding the very key thing of everything that went on that you and I are now recreated in Christ Jesus. The old things pass away, new things have come. And in that vein, what's the, what's the point? That I am to do the good works that He has prepared beforehand that I should walk in. So this whole deal that we've taken probably a year now to look at is meant to drive into us the reality and the thought that we have work to do. We have work to do. This is not about what my first pastor used to say, that we get to sit, soak, and sour. Too many people do that. You sit and hear the great word, you soak it all up, and you don't do anything with it, so you just sour, right? That's a great visual picture that my Canadian pastor gave to us when I was a little like a 12 or 13-year-old. But I remember it because it's true. And the problem with the church is we get our, our jollies out of, out of doing you know, one activity as a group to feel good about ourselves or whatever when it's meant that you personally have good works that he's called you to walk into. And too many churches want those good works to be something that has to do with the organization that we call a church, not the organism which is the church. And so what they want you to do is learn how to be an usher, a greeter, a uh, you know, Sunday school teacher, or whatever. And I'm not saying you can't find your purpose there. I'm not saying there's not even a great noble cause in those things. I want you to understand that 24-7, God has good works He wants you to walk in. This should excite you to, to, to say, I want to know what those are. And so we walk through profiles and purpose, and we've seen how, how God got people to their purpose, right? Even when they, like Jonah, who didn't want to. Jonah's going, I know what you call me to do. And if I go do that, you're going to save the people that I hate. I'm not doing it. And, and he pays to run from God, right? Pays money. Gets on a boat. Heads as far. How many of us have paid big money just to get away from God, right? And in the course of our life, we might never say that we've done that, but we've done that. Runners always do that. They pay whatever cost they can just to get away from God. Problem is, Jonah learned the same thing David did. Where can I go to flee the presence of God? Right? He's like the, uh, is it the FBI or the marshals or whoever it was that always get their man? That's who he is, right? He always gets his man. Texas Rangers. I knew it was one of those one of those law enforcement. Always he always gets his man or woman. Always. And so here's I want you to see that and know that because we're we're not done with that one thing purpose yet. So I got about three or four more messages in this and then we're gonna jump to something else. But it, these, these are truths that I want to get in my own life. And so here's what I'm asking you. Are you pondering what God wants for you in this life? Not what God wants for for you, but God, what God wants for you to do for others, right? Now, my purpose is always tied to people, always tied to people. Your purpose is always tied to people because God loves people. God saved people, so it's always tied to that. And so, so I, I want you. My the big picture goal is I want you to look back in this whole thing, and and be able to say this is what God has for me right now in my season. Because they change, right? So this is this is what, what we've seen. Now we're going to see a few signs. I think there are road marks that kind of help us know how we get to our purpose and what that purpose is. So today I just want to talk a little bit about that. Probably will be truly a short message this time. Um, and so I just want us to see it. So if you look back on, on all of this stuff, 
I think you're going to see cases where God used people, uh, or used people, right, to bring about that that purpose in their life. Didn't he do that? He did that with uh, he did that with uh, Joseph. He brought uh, Potiphar into his life, good, bad, or ugly, however you want to see it. But he did those things. He always brought people into his life. When 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 King David was drifting from his purpose, uh, and and had fallen, he brought Nathan to send him back to where he ought to be, right? God does those things. You can see that all through all through the deal. Now, purposes are seasonal as well. So it's not like I have one purpose. He says the good works, not the good work, right? Good works. So there's there's seasonal purposes. And I think we should know that. I want to read a, it's just a simple passage before we get to really two other verses that we're going to look at. One is David at the end near the end of his life, he's Solomon's an older man. Uh, Solomon's going to be king. David's still king because he's still living. He's king. Solomon is right there with him. He's got other sons. And it says this, David, David had this passion, though, that he wanted to do something for God. And so it says, it says in 1 Chronicles 28, 7, I mean 28 verse 1, it says, David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. So he's getting all his buddies together. The officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions, the services of the king, the commander of thousands, the commander of hundreds, the officials in charge of all the property, livestock belonging to the king and his sons together with the palace officials, the warriors, all the brave fighting men. He's gotten everybody in the kingdom that has a title up in his palace. And he says this, King David rose to his feet and said, listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I have had it in my heart to build a house, a place of rest, for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. I made plans to build it, right? So this he's got this passion, man. He wants to build, he wants to build a temple. He wants that ark of the covenant uh, to sit in that deal. He wants that to be seen as like the footstool of Jesus. And so, so he's gonna build it. That's his purpose. He's he's I've nailed it. And verse three says, But God said to me, You're not to build a house for my name. Because you're a warrior. And you shed blood. They think, what? But here's what's going on. David's purpose at that season of his life before this was as a warrior. He thought maybe it would be now to build a, a temple. But God made it plain to him, that's not your purpose. I'm going to tell you his purpose it is. Solomon, your son. He's going to build that temple. Listen to what it says. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. My purpose is to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as a leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose me, my family. And from my father's son, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord forever. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son. Then I will be his father, and I will establish his kingdom forever if he is unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws as is being done at this present moment. And so you realize that, that King David's purpose was seasonal. He, he had a purpose to be a warrior. He's no longer a warrior. thought his purpose was going to be to build a kingdom, but that was what belonged to Solomon. So you know what David's then purpose became? He said, fine. I... I'm not going to build a temple if I can pay for it. And so he took all the money that he had and he began to pay to build that temple. You see, that's how God works. Sometimes he's got you as the one that's going to do the work and sometimes he's called you in a season of life to be the one who helps establish the work. You, you and me are just pleased to be in his service. And so I, I bring that out because I think, I think we all find ourselves that we go through seasons, right? I mean, there's, 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 things are always in season. I think my season at the Stone Company is kind of coming to an end. And, and so, you know, I've drifted part-time and it's changed things, but, but yet there's still purpose there. But I know that, that, that you know, there are other things that, that I want to do. I, I've always been a pastor. That, that's not who I am. I mean, that's not, my title's not who I am, but it's the gift and calling that God has for me. And I don't believe that'll ever quit. But, but I want to be sure to be in his purpose, right? I want to be where he wants me to be in that arena, as you should. So, here's what I'm going to ask you. Just you don't have to speak out. Just ask me a question. Do you have any idea what the purpose is for the season of life you're in right now? Do you have a understanding of that? I'm not looking for anybody to shake their head or anything. I just want you to know and have that conversation in your own head. Do you know? Do you believe you? You know, in the ballpark, 
all right, let's just settle for that. I'm in the ballpark, right? Maybe giving's my thing, right? Or maybe teaching's my thing. Or, or maybe, you know, uh, uh, serving or, or uplifting others or, or whatever. But, but do you, you feel like you know what that purpose is? And sometimes it is tied to a job. Sometimes your purpose is that, right? I mean, we've got nurses in here, and it's obvious that some of those, it's their purpose and passion. I mean, it's what they do, right? So our vocation can be that. It's not always tied to that. And so we need to begin to just look in terms of that. Generic or specific? So I'm asking you the question. This is like, you know, are you, are you thinking with me? I'm not asking you to tell me what it is, but are you, are you thinking? Okay. Your purpose, like I say, could be your vocation, but not always. It always does revolve around relationships. And so here's where I want to, this is one of the first kind of sign things I want to talk about. I look back on my life and I realize that it was a lot of people in my past that kind of steered me into my purpose. Right? If, if, if you've ever felt, have you ever felt like you're exactly where the Lord wants you? So you, you've walked, you've done some of the good works, right? It may, may have been for a day, may have been for a week, may have been for a year, but you go, yeah, that, I, I, I was exactly in the right time in the right place because God wanted me to do some good work We're right there. Normally, people were involved. And so what I'm trying to help us understand today, this is really more of a, a, a philosophical conversation than an exegesis of the text today so that we can have a, an applicational conversation. Um, but it does matter who you walk with. Right? Proverbs 13, 20. You know what that says? He who walks with the wise will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Did y'all's parents ever give you that verse when you were a kiddo? <laughs> How about the New Testament version of it? 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Uh, uh, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Right? So who we hang around in some ways affects where we go in life. And so, and, and sometimes even the bad ones, the bad folk, can take us where we need to go. I just want you to have, this is the conversation I want you to be having in your head, is I just kind of talk at this point, because those two verses matter as it relates to relationships and people, how he moves people into our life. David never would have been become king had Samuel not listened to the Lord and said, I'm going to go to Jesse's house because that's where the Lord's called me and I'm going, to, I'm going to wait and see what the Lord does. Samuel had an assignment. His good work was to get to King David, right? That was it. And so when he gets there, he goes, that's the man. No way, that's the man. Look at him. He's like this kid, man. He messes with sheep. He plays this weird harp thing out in the field. He's like, woo, talking out among the stars and stuff. And God said, yeah, I know, I know, because you people still want to look at the outside of a man. But I'm always and only looking at the heart. Right? This was, this was how David got to his purpose. Now, God didn't always use people. Sometimes he uses dreams. Joseph, what did Joseph have? A dream. Right? But then he used people to get him. He didn't know how to get from here to there. So God brought people into his path. We've looked at these stories. I'm just reminding you of those things as we look through this. I tell you that, to tell you, uh, and I've shared this with you a bunch of times before, but there was a time in our life in 2008, I think it was, seven, eight, uh, we, I had just left the church, done. It was a brutal, ugly thing that's not the point of this story, um, but there was a lot of wounding that had been taking place in my own heart and hatred that was coming out that I was trying to deal with, but just people and the brutality of people. And uh, a pastor friend of mine said, you should call my friend Bob Baxter, who helps pastors who are either burnt out or found themselves in some immoral situation or whatever, and I think it'd be good for you. So I remember being in Gatlinburg with my kids and my family, having checked out a life, and I made the phone call, and um, Bob said, man, we're, we're booked. I'm like, good, I don't want to talk to anybody anyway. Really, truly, it was like good. So I uh, hung up the phone and uh, told Tam, I said, well, it's not going to work out. I don't know how long later it was, but he called back and he said, hey, tell you what. He said, Bob and Laura, our weekend's free, like in two weekends from now. Why don't you just come out? You won't be with everybody, but we'll just hang out. I'm like, well, that sounded better because I'm going to bear my mess to everybody. I at least 
don't want a crowd, you know, saying you're in that place. And uh, so we jumped on a plane, went to Oklahoma City. He picked us up. I've shared this story before. We get in, the, in his car, and as soon as Tammy scooted out of the way, he looked at me and he said, uh, so what's the worst thing I can know about you? <laughs> well, well, hello and welcome to Oklahoma, right? Um, and so, you know, I spoke a little bit about my bitterness and anger. And he said, well, you got nothing to worry about. Now. Like, first time I thought, I might be okay. This man spoke volumes in my life in just a little bit of time. So we had these incredible dinners, and uh, I mean, it's a ranch, and the guy can cook. So we cooked, and he ate, we ate, and we rode horses, and we did all, we drove cattle, and we did all these weird things. It was amazing. But we sat in their, in their uh, Ponderosa-style room, and they wheeled out this whiteboard. And he had given me a, a homework assignment. You've heard this story before. I want, I, want, I want you to do the same thing, though. So a big whiteboard, one line right down the middle. And so my job was to start as early as I can remember and think of significant events that took place in my life. And with, if it was a good event, you put it above the line. If it was a bad event, you put it below the line. And you chronologically did that. So I did that, Tammy did that, when our lines diverged uh, or, or intersected together, then we began to, to see how that played out. And then I, you know, I was still unsure of the exercise when he had asked us to do that earlier, and then you know, we kind of just laid it out and, and showed it. But when we, uh, when we sat down, Laura, his wife, stood up, and she just spoke into our heart in ways I don't think I've ever spoken before. And what she revealed to us was that all those bad things that I had in my life were actually things that took me to a, a better place. And those good things were, you know, were good, but, but I saw woven in my life for the first time why I was who I was and why the hurts and baggage that I had was there, why, why bitterness, why blind, blind spots. We all have blind spots, don't we? And so I believe God brings into our life people to help show us our blind spots. And we don't always like it when they do, but God's getting us to our purpose. Okay, I hope this is making sense. It feels weird to, to have this kind of message as opposed to one where I'm just expounding on the, on the truth of the word, but this is applicational issues. So I want you to, I want you to think of your life, because you, listen, we have all these things in our life, and if we're not careful, we don't see how they were woven together. My pastor shared this illustration with me one time, and never forget it. He said, I used to sit at my grandmother's feet when she had a needlepoint. He said, she'd do that stuff. And he said, from the bottom side, just all these strings. You ever seen that? You know, put the band on that material and they're doing something. But you sit below it and all these strings are dangling everywhere and nothing makes sense. And it looks like this garbled mess until you stand up and look at it from the top side. And then you see it's all perfect. But see, sometimes our life, if we're just looking at it from this side, all we see is these strings of mess and nothing makes sense. Why did I go through that? What was that about? How come that person came into my life? How come God took that person from my life, right? But when we get to the top side, we may never get to it from this life, but when we get to the top side, it's all going to make perfect sense. And so here's this is where we're going, and I'm going to leave you with this. Um, we encounter God through people that he's going to bring into our lives and has already. Some teach us uh, what's ahead in the journey. Y'all ever have anybody that does help, helps you with that? Say, hey, here's what, here's where you're going to go, right? Here's here's some bad stuff that's, that that when this happens, this is this is how it goes. As a pastor, I've always found other pastors who tell me when you transition from here to here, here's what you can expect, right? We all have stories about someone who's helped us uh, because they're further along in the journey to tell us, watch out for this pothole and that pothole and this one. But make sure you slow down long enough to see this, right? So we should anticipate that God is going to bring into our life people that are going to be a little further down the road than we are. Some people are already walking in the purpose that he's called you to walk in, right? Because there is a baton that's passed in these purposes, right? My purpose won't be here forever. Someone will come along and have a, that same purpose, and it's my job to hand that baton to them as, as I move on. And so I, I need those people in my life. Here's what I'm saying. As you look and decide where your purpose is, there's probably somebody already doing it, and God's going to bring them in your life to kind of just show you how it's done. Does that make sense to us?
I think you should be looking at those people. Some of them may have already been in your life. So if we could take that horizontal line and look at it like a, a 3D uh, uh, GPS, just stand right where you are right now and don't worry about where you are. Just know here's where I am and turn around and look backwards and just try to see who are the people that God brought into my life that has taken me here. Because I think in that you're going to find your purpose. I know some people God brought in my life put me back on track. Bob was one of those, right? Just like Jonah, you're running, and then you get to a certain spot, and God slaps you in the face and sends you on your way. Bob was that guy for me. And there have been several that were that way for me. There was a, uh, and I've shared this with you too, there was a time when um, early on in our ministry, my, my best friend um, decided that... Um, I was um, a heretic and uh, because I believed that God, that prayer can actually change things. And um, it was, he was just very, you know, he's, prayer changes me, not you. It's a, and it's a theological argument people get into. He basically called everybody in the church and told them I was a heretic. And he was leaving and they should too. And so we had half the church left. I had laughed and scoffed at people who had depression and anxiety. I thought they were weak-minded people who just didn't know how to live life. Until you're laying on a sofa and you can't get up because you're overcome with, with just anxiety and depression and all of those things. And I was invited to go to Mission Birmingham and attend this thing. So I did. And I told the Lord, I said, when I go, I may have shared this with you before, I probably have. When I go, the first person asks me how I'm doing, I'm going to bomb it all over them. So you better make sure whoever comes and sits down next to me is ready, because I'm ready. I don't know what, you know, and so, and, and so I sat down, and I, I, I've been thinking all week about this guy's name, but he owned one of the re Christian radio stations, I think somewhere up in Gadsden, but anyway, he owned all those things. And uh, I sit down next to him, and he goes, you know, hey, I'm Randy, and he said his name, and he said, so how's it going? I, I literally kind of glanced up to heaven like, all right, well, I told you what's coming, and I vomited all over that man and told him everything I thought about church and people and everything else. And he calmly, this I'm off my I'm off my track, right? You understand? I'm, I'm my purpose is is whacked out. I'm just trying to figure out what I'm what my next move is. But yet God and His sovereignty is going to get me to my purpose because that's what He called me to do. And so this man lovingly said to me, he said Randy, said, look, he said I'm not really a pastor, but he said I know a little bit about sheep, and life, and he said. You are a pastor, and God's given you some sheep that you should shepherd. You don't get to decide who they are. Those that are your shepherd, I mean your sheep, they can't leave you. And those that aren't, they can't stay. And when you quit worrying about who comes and goes and just love on the people that are there, life's going to get better for you. It was, <laughs> it was the most holy moment I believe I've had in, in a long time in my life. Because it, it, if you know what it feels like, those of you who have been depressed or you have anxiety, and it's just like somebody just tossed it away. It, it's, it's like all of a sudden, you're as light as can be. It, the, the weight, everything's gone. That's what took place. That moment when that man walked into my life, sat down in that chair by a sovereign God to put me back on track. And so... I'm saying these things because I desperately want all of us to find our purpose. I, I, I don't want to talk about me. I just want you to understand those things. And then I think sometimes there are people on our journey just to encourage us, right? Because doing the will of God can get hard, can it? There's a lot of times you want to quit and give up and think it's too hard. Nobody cares. Nobody even knows what I'm doing. What, what am I doing here? Nobody sees this. Nobody cares. I'm not making a difference. The guy's going to bring that one person in your life and go, hey, let me tell you, you may not remember this. You know, 10 years ago, five years ago, you said this to me, and it transformed my life. How many of y'all had people do that to you before, right? Go ahead. It's okay to admit that God used you in somebody's life. That happens because God is saying, don't you forget your purpose. I want us to see these encounters that we're having as God loving on us to say, you're not escaping. I'm going to keep you on your journey towards your good works. I'm going to send you people to nudge you along. I'm going to send you some to bring you back. 
I'm going to send you, I'm going to send some people who are behind you, which is one of those others. There's some a little bit behind us and we just want to tell them what's coming. Right. And there are people who, who are behind us that we're going to find our purpose in as we just turn around and they ask, they say, what are you doing? And you start telling them about what's going on. They're going to want to partner with you in that. This is, this is how purpose works. God's always working. This is what I want us to understand. There's a common thread, I believe, in your life that is leading you to your purpose. I can only tell you mine. I can tell you how I came to be a pastor because that is my purpose because of certain men he brought into my life at just the time I needed them. And, and I can look back and realize he was setting me up. He was. When I was a kid, my mom and dad, we, we weren't going to church. Um, but but my mom and dad started going to church. I'm not saying the only reason why was because I was going to be a pastor, but that played into it. But my mom and dad are tra- were attractional people, and they they when when they came to Christ, man, it was like uh, people love being around my mom and dad. And so the pastor would come, and my mom and dad were always being drugged into leadership positions somewhere. And missions was their heart. And every Sunday when missionaries were in town, we had a very mission-minded church. They would come sit at our table. We got to eat at the big table when the missionaries came on Sunday. And so I'd sit there and I'd listen to these missionary stories. And the kid just enamored with what was going on in these kids, in these people's lives. I never knew the guy was positioned in my heart to really have a heart for missions. I didn't know that. Um, when I felt like a loser and a geek in junior high school, or really my whole life, but... Uh, but uh, <laughs> But but I remember the time in, in high school when I really felt like I didn't know who I was. That God brought an old radio disc jockey, uh, Rich Ryder of the ERC Traffic Copter, into my life as a youth pastor. And he forced me to do things. He, he taught me how to play tennis and golf. We went uh, dune buggy riding in his Volkswagen Thing, if you know what one of those is. Wow. And he asked me theological conversations and wouldn't let me go, well, oh no. He, he forced me to. And he made me believe that I was somebody. And he altered my personality in a good way. I became a much more outgoing because there's a, you, when you get a confidence, it's already in there, but confidence keeps you from doing it. When somebody's confident in you and gives you confidence and unleashes something, Rich Teeters unleashed something in me that was already there by God. I didn't know how to get it out. And I'm forever indebted to that man uh, for, for what he did in my life. And when I decided to enroll in Bible college, the professors that he brought into my life all spoke into my life. And it's been my, that all the way through the course of my life. And God has always... So it wasn't hard for me to know his purpose because he'd already put people in my life to see to it that I got there. This is my whole message today is that I'm convinced that you have a, if every one of you in this room has a purpose... And, and I'm determined that before the Lord moves me on, I'm not going anywhere, I'm saying that death or whatever, you know, uh, that you all know that what that is. And so I want you to, this week, one goal. Just think about the people God's brought into your life because you're going to find it's going to give you a good insight into what God wants you to do. Is that a deal? You're going to do that for me? All right. I'm going to pray with us. And we're going to uh, We're going to sing. Thank you, Father, for the truth that, that we do find in your word and the, the power of it. It's your power to know that you are so sovereign that you can move men and women in and out of our lives and us in and out of the lives of others so that you get glory and the purposes that you have are fulfilled. Father, I don't want to miss one opportunity to do the work that you call me to. I don't want to miss one conversation that should be taking place and it goes to somebody else because I was too occupied with something else. I want to walk in your purpose. And so I'm asking you to do the same with my friends here today and that you would let us see just through the lives of people that you brought into our own life where you're taking us. Because sometimes, Father, it seems hard to know what you want for us. And I'm grateful that you use people to bring that about. So do your work in us this week, Father, as we begin to discover our purpose. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.